So in the last 30 years, we've invented 95% of the universe. 95% of the universe we've invented because the model wasn't working. We invented dark matter and dark energy, and they're patches. They're patches to a model that wasn't working. The model didn't work, and so we said, well, we'll just invent something. Most of us think that science is true, but Stanford professor John Ioannidis demonstrated that the majority of scientific papers make claims that are never successfully repeated, and we should therefore conclude are false. Meanwhile, post-realist philosopher Hilary Lawson argues that science is never true in the sense of describing the ultimate character of reality, but is instead a way of framing the world to enable us to intervene. So we've got kind of science as a process, and science is giving us models that don't get close to reality. So this is going to be a really great debate. Um, I wonder, I'm going to start with you, um, Hilary, with the first theme. But does the problem of perspective and bias make obje objective truth impossible? And how should we move forward if it does? I think there's an enormous amount out there, actually hugely more than we imagine because what we usually think is out there is limited by our perspective uh, to the particular bits we see. Well, I think there's an indefinite amount of stuff out there on the one hand. And on the other, uh, I don't think we're just free to make up any old stuff that we want. We are heavily constrained in the models or theories that we put forward because we carry them from pa our past inheritance of what they mean and how they work, and we need to get them to work. So it's not as if we can make up any old stuff. It's just that they don't uncover reality. That's not the sort of stuff that they're doing. And we need to give up this notion of reality, which uh, sounds very down to earth, but is actually, I think, at the end, a theological idea. It's a sort of idea of an ultimate stuff out there in the sense that God, what is God? Is God, God was everywhere and everything and uh, indescribable and unattainable. Well, that's exactly what reality is. It's everywhere and anything, uh, and it's un unattainable and it's undescribable. And I think that gives us a clue to what's going I don't think we arrive at a description of reality any more than we were able to arrive at a description of God. It's, a, it's a, an end, end point sort of fantasy. And I think we would be better to give up on that not in favour of giving up the key bits of the Enlightenment that really are valuable, which is looking at the world. So I think we have to operate within our models and look very carefully to see whether they work or not. Which of these different models is a preferable one? Why, why, why might it be? So we have to look really carefully and we have to use reason as well in terms of what else we want to adhere to and so forth. So we don't have to give up the core tools, as it were, of the Enlightenment, of, of empiricism and rationalism, but I think we do have to give up the fantasy of the real. And that's, so not kind of rejecting entirely the scientific method. but Absolutely that not. In some ways, I am wanting to deepen the scientific method, to get it to escape from the theology of the real, to uh, recognising what we need to do to get models to work more effectively, and indeed to what are the constraints on our generation of models. I mean, that was what I was up to with, with and, the overall thing. And then, and then maybe our... our our perspectives and bias therefore influence the models that we create. I mean, the perspectives and biases that we have influence how we see and observe the world. Of course they do. But that doesn't mean to say we can get rid of them. Yeah. You know, if you use the word bias, you think, well, well let's just try and get rid of all bias. There's no such thing as getting rid of all bias. There's no neutrality. There's no God's eye view. Um, we are always locked into a perspective and we need to be aware of that when we are generating our model. That doesn't invalidate it, it just means to say uh, that we need to be aware of it. I wonder, John, if you want to comment on perspectives and bias and how that influenced the scientific process. I, I think clearly bias and perspective influences our, our efforts. You know, the, the process is guided largely by initiative, by human initiative, by uh, what you want to study to start with, you know, what funding you will get from whom um, what is the narrative that is likely to be acceptable, tolerable, desirable. Um, therefore, you're struggling to fight against expectations uh, in many ways that, are, that can be very strong, you know, especially if the sponsor or if the funder or if the environment is such that uh, uh, everybody's expecting from you to get this answer. And if you don't get that answer, <laughs> you're not a good person or you, know, you, you have messed up or, or you're not going to get funded next time, perhaps. Um, so, any way that we could remove these forces, 
from the equation, from the application of the scientific method, which has a long tradition of many centuries. You know, we know how it works, how some parts of it are difficult, but any way that we could remove bias, that we could neutralize perspective as much as possible, I think is desirable. Can this be done? Uh, it's very difficult. So I, I, I don't want to say that we can have the perfect science uh, or that you can have a robot or AI or LLM. I mean, that, that, that actually might be even worse <laughs> because it has instilled and digested and absorbed uh, and transmuted all of our biases in a sense. Exactly. The, the challenge is really major, but I think it's worth it. And what we do know is that for different types of, of study designs and for different types of research methods, and research practices, if we do them right, and if we remove bias, we have some anticipation that our method can be that good. So it, it may be 80% correct, or it may have this level of accuracy, or it, it may be good enough to give us an answer that when I go to clinic, I can save some lives, or if I go to public health, or if I build a bridge, you know, it will not collapse. Um, but in other situations, uh, the, the threshold of removing these biases desires so much effort mm. that maybe in some areas of science we have to say we need to abandon ship. You know, we have tried that. Mm. We have published 10 papers, 1,000 papers, 1 million papers. There's fields in science that we published a million papers. We're getting nowhere, like, you know, nutritional epidemiology. I would say abandon ship. That's not the, the way to answer these questions. Let's try to be more imaginative, more disruptive, think out of the box, uh, and we've had enough of that. Uh, bias and perspective is not gonna go away, no matter what we do. So we need to move on. It, it, so there's no one size fits all for, for bias and perspective, but the more neutral, the more um, kind of say detached <laughs> in some sorts uh, approach might be best. Sometimes I have thought that maybe the best questions to ask are those that Nobody is interested. Nobody is funding. Nobody cares <laughs> about the answer. Perhaps not even the researcher herself <laughs> or themselves are, are interested in uh, what answer that might be. Uh, then we may have a better chance to, to get something that is more reliable. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there are two things I think that are oper going on here. On the one hand, I'm sure we would be both agreed that we're all trying to get, would like to get around a situation where people are deliberately either falsifying the results or, or, or determinedly trying to get a certain sort of result to work without bearing in mind other factors. Of course, that's the case. And uh, bias in that sense, of course, we, we, we need to try and get rid of. And I think the only hesitation I would have with the notion that we get rid of bias is, the, is as I was saying before, that we could get rid of it altogether. That um, we can't get rid of our perspective, as it were, and see the world neutrally. That, that is a fantasy. Um, there is no neutral perspective. There is no God's eye view. And sometimes, as, as I think you were alluding to, John, you can get situations in, in science where people are pursuing a particular model. It is proposed that this is the true model. They've got the idea, well, it's the one true model. And it sort of runs aground. It, it sort of got you get lots, of, lots of different attempts to try and make some bits work because that's the framework. But actually, uh, an alternative uh, uh, framework altogether might be more effective. And negotiating that shift is very difficult because there are lots of institutional pressures to maintain the current conventional view. Um, I, I, I fully agree. There's a lot of inertia in, in science for, for, yeah. for many reasons. Uh, science might be seen as a progressive, uh, forward-looking, but in fact there's a lot of inertia. And, uh, I, I can think about myself, I will defend my theories and my findings and my papers, uh, uh, vehemently so. So I think everyone will do some of that, perhaps uh, uh, forgetting uh, that a lot of that might be wrong and a lot of that might be biased. And I, I would also have to acknowledge that what is a neutral perspective is even difficult to define. I mean, it, it cannot be defined by voting, you know, taking these 40 million scientists and ask them to vote on what is your perspective on this question or that question, or say that, well, we will narrow it only to those who are experts. Who, who are the experts? Uh, in in COVID-19, we published data showing that if you divide science into 174 fields, uh, every single field moved its experts into COVID-19. You know, the last field to fall was automobile engineering 
in the fall of 2020. <laughs> but they got there in the end. <laughs> well, it, it, it was not about how to enhance social distancing, uh, you know, people sitting in the, in the trunk and some of them hanging out the window. It, it was automobile engineers doing epidemiology. Uh, so so w everyone has biases, everyone has perspective. It cannot be settled with vote counting, it cannot be settled with uh, majority uh, opinions, it cannot be settled by assigning expertise based on citations or uh, awards or, or whatever. It is a dynamic process and, and we should be aware that it is a dynamic process and we can always be wrong and we have to watch out. We have to watch our back mm. that we may be wrong. But this doesn't mean that we cannot gradually, hopefully, mm. get rid of some of that burden of wrongness. <laughs> and I think that that balance is a really tricky one because in one sense, I'm often in a situation is encouraging the idea, well, we can have new uh, ways of holding the world, new, new theories. But of course, um, a lot of the new ways of holding the world are, are, are rubbish and they're, they're not going to work very well. And, and, and they don't work as well as the one that we've been operating for the last hundred years. And, and so it, it's a balance that we do need to recognize that our current way of holding the world is just a limited um, perspective. It's a, it's a particular model, it can work very well, but, but at the same time, we need to be open to alternatives, but not so open that we, we, we are just distracted by the next interesting idea. And there are some areas where I, I think you can see in science that you see this very extremely. So in cosmology, for example, we've all operated with the idea of the Big Bang uh, for quite a long time now. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and yet there are all sorts of problems in cosmology which are appearing all over the place. Um, and as a result, we're having to modify our model of the universe in radical ways. So in the last 30 years, we've invented 95% of the universe. 95% of the universe we've invented because the model wasn't working. We invented um, dark matter and dark energy, and they're patches. They're patches to a model that wasn't working. The model didn't work, and so we said, well, we'll just invent something. We don't have any, any evidence for them. We just think we, we need to do this in order to sustain a model. I'm not critical of that. That is how our models work. That's how our closures work. That's how we get them to keep on going. But we need to recognize that's what we're up to and not to get stuck in thinking, well, it's got to be like this because it's just as possible with cosmology, which I think has got all sorts of problems, that maybe we've got something more fundamentally uh, problematic. Maybe we should be giving up Big Bang altogether. Maybe we should have a different. And at some points, you just get to like a paradigm shift where you go, no, we've got to try something altogether different. I'm really interested in what you were saying about this kind of need for new models, but within some kind of constraints, like yeah. have a little bit of fun, but not too much. But fun. not too much. And who sets those constraints? Because John's pointed out funders setting those constraints kind of limits the type of results that you get because everyone's working towards what the funder wants. So if the funder's telling you research these areas, that influences the science that's done. Mm. So who in this To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.